Today I'm joined by Bob Zinga. He's the head of information security at Directly and also the information warfare commander for the U.S. Navy Reserve. He's kind of badass. But before we meet him, we got to listen to this. Welcome to AI Nerd, AI with Attitude, where I try to make things as unnerdy as possible. Enjoy learning today about the latest trending technology. But before we begin, please subscribe, hit the notifications button, give it a like, and drop a comment below. Welcome to AI Nerd, AI with Attitude. And today I'm going to get a bunch of attitude to Bob Zinga, who is the head of information security at Directly. But he's also kind of a badass because he's the information warfare commander for the U.S. Navy Reserve. He may be a SEAL, we don't know. He may be a spy, we don't know. But what we do know is that he has joined me here today. Bob, how are you? Great, great. I can tell for sure I am not a SEAL. <laughs> That's a very, very special cadre of uh, sailors. But anyway, I'm very, very glad to be at them. Um... That's what all spies say, that they're not a spy. <laughs> and as a security guy, I bet you know how to pick. Can you know how to pick a lock? Can you pick a lock, manually pick a lock? Uh, I have learned how to do that, yes. Because are physical security to... is, like, is actually part of information security. Oh, are you, are you wanted in any countries? For, no, no, no. <laughs> Just asking. No, I mean, you, you, you just admitted you know how to pick a lock. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> may, when you become an information security professional, you kind of have to learn to do that. So. That's that's amazing. All right, so tell me tell me a little about you. So uh, thanks for having us on. I'm going to be quiet, and I tell everybody this. <laughs> Enjoy the moments I'm not talking. So um, uh, I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to let you tell me about your journey, who you are, how you how you got to where you, you are, and you know you're you're a cybersecurity um, expert, but you've got to defend that now. Tell me why. So tell me all about you. Well, it's it's a very very long story. Yeah. So uh, today I am the head of information security for Directly. I believe you just talked to my boss, uh, my CEO, Mike Delacruz. So we are an emerging leader in customer experience uh, automation, uh, helping company deliver better customer service uh, at scale. So we use uh, you know, artificial intelligence, uh, machine learning, but we also, I think what differentiates us from uh, most of the competition out there, we also use human being, we call them uh, expert or uh, specialist and uh, providing a gig economy for them, but also helping our AI get uh, smarter and also have uh, human-like uh, qualities. Uh, anyway, so I am also, uh, a commander in the U.S. Navy Reserves. So I guess, uh, I mean, it's a very, very long story, but um, when I came to the U.S., I was back in 1996. Uh, my original dream was to become a medical doctor. So I was a pre-med student at the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. Uh, and uh, for anybody who knows anything about college football, that's really the town to be. But anyway, so uh, I was there. I, I earned my uh, Bachelor of Science in Chemistry and uh, Biology. Uh, I think I did it in three years only. And uh, I was in the honors program there. So by the time I graduated, I had an uh, honors uh, thesis um, published. And I decided to kind of skip the uh, master's and go for the uh, PhD, right? Uh, because that at the time, um, I was really considering on going for the MD program at the University of uh, Alabama, Birmingham. However, that was in 1999. Back then, about 100,000 people in America died because of doctor's mistake. Uh, basically, uh, my idea of a doctor back then was a glorified pharmacist, right? Uh, I remember being in the pre-med program. Uh, I used to be in the, uh, uh, what, what they, they, they called uh, uh, physician shadow um, program with the uh, Honors Society for, um, uh, was it Alpha Epsilon Delta for pre-med uh, student? And I would shadow uh, doctors at the uh, local clinic there on campus, but uh, I was really shocked to see that some of the doctors, uh, they would talk to the patient and then kind of go back to the back room and you know, look at this black book and kind of look at the symptom and kind of figure out which medicine to, pres to prescribe. I was like, no, if I'm gonna be a doctor, that's not the type of doctor. I want to be, but anyway, make a very long story short. So I decided to go for the PhD. So I would actually you know, understand the science behind um, medicine and so forth and do research and then eventually uh, get back on the uh, MD track. Uh, but no, like they say, you know, life happens to you. And I got married, I had a baby on the way and I had to have a full-time job. And uh, you know, being a poor doctoral student, I think I was making about $1,000 stipend every single month uh, for my uh, graduate student uh, assistantship back, back then. That just wasn't cutting it. So 
I ended up working uh, full time in tech and uh, then I got good at it. And when I was working on my Microsoft uh, certified uh, system engineer uh, certification back then, uh, I decided to study the uh, security track and that's kind of where I, I fell in love with uh, security. And I had an opportunity to do uh, cybersecurity full time in 2005, uh, working for the uh, CISO, the first CISO of the University of Alabama. And 20 years later is still there, pretty, pretty amazing. But um, yeah, that, that is kind of how it started for, for me. So as far as my uh, uh, doctorate, I am what you would call the ABD, all but dissertation. Uh, so at some point in the future, I don't know if it's gonna be possible, but uh, if I wanna be poor for another couple of years or so, I could probably uh, finish uh, uh, my uh, doctorate in microbiology. But anyway, uh, doing security at the University of Alabama, uh, I think uh, maybe five years uh, after I, I started, uh, I had an offer from some crazy uh, Californian folks who uh, wanted to uh, pretty much you know more than double my salary for a great opportunity uh, at the uh, Defense Language Institute. So I couldn't say no to that. So uh, I definitely uh, took the uh, offer, you know, packed my bags, got my family and we moved to the wild, wild west. And uh, we really never uh, looked uh, back. And from uh, Monterey, I then moved to Silicon Valley in 2014. And I've been a part of uh, a lot of high tech uh, companies, both private and uh, uh, public uh, as well, like uh, Groupon. And I also was a consultant, which was pretty cool. I had about a dozen uh, customers, most, most of them small and medium sized, but a couple of big ones. So I was really exposed to a lot of uh, technology and uh, uh, it was a really, really great uh, experience uh, and, until directly made me an offer almost three, three years ago to uh, join the team as the head of uh, information you, security. I, I've definitely brought down the average IQ of this, this conversation. <laughs> it seems like the, your real passion is to learn. And, I just, and maybe at the time that, you know, there's what your parents and other people yeah. say, because you're so smart, you should become versus what you really have a passion for it and, and the speed of the passion. So I heard, yeah. I love learning doctors move too slow. Technology is really cool and, fast <laughs> and, move, and it's more in the pace of what I believe in. Maybe I misheard it. I don't listen very well, but. No, I, um, I think there is definitely some, some truth to that. Yeah, uh, I think when I was a kid, my parents definitely, uh, influenced me and my siblings too, right? Um, yeah, I, I think becoming a medical doctor was probably uh, something, oh, although I think I, I kind of want, wanted to, but I think my uh, mother wanted it more than I did. Uh, let's just put it <laughs> that way. But but uh, this this is the uh, uh, funny thing though. Uh, what I didn't mention is in 2004, so after 9-11, right? At the time I was not a US citizen or even the permanent resident of the US yet. So I tried to uh, join uh, the military. I talked to everybody, the Navy, the Air Force, the uh, Army, and the uh, Marines. But I, I really liked the, the Navy, number one, and the Air Force, number two. But anyway, all of them said, no, uh, can't join, right? You're not a citizen. You don't have your green card, so go, go back then. No? Like with Terminator, I said, I'll be back. Uh, and even, even prior to that, when I was a student at UA, I tried to join the uh, ROTC uh, program. Um, and part of the reason is because uh, when I was 17 years old, I don't know where that came from, but I just knew in my heart, no matter what you did in the 21st century, you had to be good at three things. You had to become an expert in three specific areas. One is technology, because I felt like you no know, technology will just get you know, more uh, cr critical and uh, integral to everything uh, we do. Two, uh, business. Uh, and uh, number three, uh, leadership. So you had to become a better leader. You had to understand the basics of business and then uh, also really be good at technology. Like even as, even back then when I thought about becoming a medical doctor, well, I'm gonna be a doctor and I understand the science, that is great, but I still need to you know, kind of have an handle on technology because everything doctors do today, you have to have computers, right? Uh, all of the um, machine they use to do tests and so forth, that's all tech technology. And then you're also gonna need, if you have your own practice, you know, understand business and you know, kind of uh, try to make your practice profitable so that was important and then also being a leader having a uh, a, uh, a staff and, and being able to lead them in the vision of the company but um anyway so part of those things i, I just effectively knew i wanted to to become better at was leadership i, I would say said no and then again after 9 11 i tried to join all four branches of the military they all said no and uh, as soon as i became a uh, uh, permanent resident that was in 2004 
then I uh, went back to my uh, recruiter. Okay, you said I needed to be a permanent resident. Now I am. So how do I join? Uh, and then they're like, okay, you you do have a degree. Maybe you can become an officer. But, oh, but you're not a citizen. You can't get the security clearance yet. So no, if you join, you have to be enlisted. I'm like, okay, let's let's do it. Let's let's get enlisted. And then uh, the day after I became a U.S. citizen, that was in 2006. So two years later, I went back to the officer recruiter. Okay, you said I need to be a U.S. citizen in order to become an officer. Okay. I am an I am a US citizen now. How do I become an officer? And the process uh, got started. It took about a year and a half or so, but I finally became an, an, an officer. And this past April, I finally achieved uh, no, one of my lifetime dreams to become a senior officer in the military. So yeah, I was commander. To, uh, that's, commander. Yeah. That's uh, so, well, what, next is captain, then rear admiral, then admiral. Is that correct? Well, I'm not so sure about that. I've been in 17 years now. I, uh, three more years, I can retire. And I think uh, my boss has told me I should retire. So we'll, <laughs> we, we will see. We will see. Uh, because they, being in the military does uh, impact all of your family, right? Your uh, your spouse and uh, your children. Uh, it's uh, it is it is not a one a one person thing. No. Not okay. telling how I'm, many I'm birthdays and special occasion I have missed uh, because of my commitment uh, to the Navy. Well, that's and well, I always tell thanks for serving because I never did, but uh, I do appreciate the others to have. Um, and, and you know, I think coming up here in about what ten days or so, we have uh, Cybersecurity Month, right in November. Um, and no, actually, it's October. It's right, right now. Oh, it's right now. Yeah. So right National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. So, um, so, so, so what are what are your top top three takeaways? Or if you need five, do five. For <laughs> companies, any size, what are the th- what are the musts they must do for cybersecurity? Well, uh, I think the most important thing I believe is to have a person who is actually responsible for cybersecurity for the enterprise. Right? Uh, it shouldn't be a function that is shared by a lot of people. There needs to be one person at the head. I think that is very. Uh, important. Now, once you do that, um, what I've seen, especially with smaller companies, sometimes, you know, they are kind of forced to have someone in charge of cybersecurity or have somebody lead the cybersecurity function because you know, they, they want to sell. And uh, most customers, especially Fortune 500 companies, they want to sell to, uh, will not buy from them unless they feel like they take cybersecurity uh, seriously. And uh, what usually happens is they, uh, uh, they kind of have this uh, check boxes that uh, they, they check, they have someone, but then they don't really empower them to do anything, right? They, they may have the uh, responsibility for cyber, but then they don't have the uh, resources to actually be able to uh, implement their uh, strategy and get things done. So uh, to me, uh, number two may be more important than number one, not only you need to have someone in that position, but you, you really need to empower them uh, to make changes and to implement their uh, strategy, right? Cybersecurity has to really be, uh, you need to get support from the very, very top. Senior management has to support the cybersecurity program. Otherwise, no, there is no no reason to uh, add it. The, the person in that role, men or women, needs to add uh, a voice. And uh, we don't have to do everything they say, but you definitely have to listen to them and uh, consult with them. They, they really need to have a seat at the table. I think that is uh, very uh, crucial. And then uh, number three, I would say, you know, uh, kind of follow the uh, best security practices. Uh, one thing I have noticed, especially with uh, uh, smaller uh, companies, not very, very different from, from the Navy, uh, sometimes um, they don't even follow the simple practices for cyber security. No, simple things like having, not only having a very uh, uh, strong password, meaning it is complex and long, but also enabling um, 2FA, right, two-factor. Uh, authentication, making sure that I everything you do is in, encrypted, right? But in the 21st century, you absolutely have to to add it. With without it, you know, chances are pretty high your account will get hacked, right? Because for for most people, yeah. most consumers out there, the only thing between their critical information and the hacker is a simple password. And I'm, I must tell you, I've been tra- tra- tracking this closely since uh, 2009. The number one password in America today is like one, two, three, four, five, six, or password, or password one, one, two, three. Those are very, very simple passwords, and those are the password actors are going to try first. So if that's your password and you are listening to me, or if uh, the, the, the pin right to your ATM card or or whatever is like one, two, three, four, five, uh, you 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 really need to change to change that. But um, anyway, so just uh, following the uh, um, basic cyber security principle. And actually putting them uh, into uh, practice, I think, uh, will help you uh, a long way. Because I think many times, uh, all of the uh, hacking and data breaches that we hear about, these hackers, sometimes they 
it is like a crime of opportunity, right? It's not like they are really going after you, but because uh, you don't have any security controls in place and you're not even following the best security practices, it's so easier, right? So they, it, it is the lower sending code. So they, they just uh, take advantage and, and, and then, uh, you know, they uh, exploit those vulnerabilities and, and get access to your uh, data. So uh, I think you really need to have someone who has the knowledge, the experience, and uh, who has the support from senior management to start implementing those best practices across the entire right. uh, organization. I think just not buying people gift cards is a great way to start. I mean, that's a nice, easy one, right? <laughs> and I have yeah, been the sure. sole beneficial uh, from some, uh, I, apparently I have Nigerian princes in my family that have <laughs> left me a lot of money. Uh, I'm still waiting for it. I've given, I've given nice. them quite a bit to travel here. They, they never seem to make it. They, if they ask for one more gift card, though, I'm not going to do it. I'm done. Yes, but but really a lot of that has to do with common sense, right? Uh, because many times these hackers don't, are not actually extremely smart, right? Because uh, many, many times they find out about vulnerabilities because the vendors like Microsoft, you know, every uh, patch uh, Tuesday, first Tuesday of every month, Microsoft will tell everybody what is wrong with their uh, operating system where the vulnerabilities are. So you just have to, to read it and then uh, you can figure out how to exploit that. But also uh, many of them uh, really attack you at the human level, right? It's social engineering. It has nothing to do with the technology at all. They kind of uh, uh, try to uh, uh, exploit your greed or uh, fear and uh, uh, get you to give them access to some type of uh, information they shouldn't have access to. And then from there, they can move across your organization and uh, uh, do some very, very bad things. Uh, it looks like we're running out of time. Uh, it makes me as angry as Thanos when <laughs> I see this happen. I just get really... Hmm. Yeah, you but are the, an interesting. The, I gotta tell you, um, is, uh, you, you would be a fun person to have a drink with. I would tell you what. I mean, maybe you don't drink, but I'll <laughs> do it for you if you don't. Um, that's fine. I can do that. I'm very good at it. Uh, tell me something. <laughs> Give me the future of cybersecurity. You know, you, you're you you will you see things that you're you can't to talk about on the uh, mm -hmm. on the side. You know, on the cybersecurity side, and you know, I have a small stint working with Cyber Command out of uh, the Air Force. Oh, nice. Um, not nearly to the level of you, but I've spent enough time in a skiff here and there to have a conversation. So uh, can't, those aside, those types of things, from the commercial side, and, and I'll tie it back to directly, you know, you're passing a lot of information through chat. And, mm -hmm. you know, and, and I love that these smart forms pop up and these little pieces, but I'm also like, yeah, but it, I think that's for my comfort because at the end of the day, I'm still entering the information online. <laughs> so it's like, tell me maybe like... Um, what you guys have done without making it so heavy on the security side of directly that you've taken all this life experience and, you know, it's, it's like the shameless plug time, like one of the competitive advantages, the fact that you have a security information officer on a chat, I, I honestly yeah. don't think in startups, you see that too much. Actually, I, don't, I haven't met very many people yeah. head of security on a startup. It's, you know, it's the last thought, right? We're just trying to get customers. We don't worry about security, but you're there already. So what is your competitive yes. advantage that you bring now into that, that startup? Well, uh, a couple of uh, things, right? Be because now also uh, security and privacy, there is a whole lot of uh, overlap. Uh, I think for small businesses and uh, startups, part of the, the pressure I think is going to be uh, regulation as well. I think regulation is coming, but also a lot of uh, the pressure many smaller uh, companies, especially from the time when I was a uh, consultant, I uh, was Fortune 500 uh, cus 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 customers, right? Or the US government, if, if you want to do business with Fortune 100 company or the US government, those organizations care a whole lot about security. So they are pretty much going to uh, force you uh, to improve your uh, cybersecurity posture before they become a client. Like when, when I was a, a consultant, most of the customer we, we got was because they would receive you know, 2000 uh, security questionnaire they had to, to fill out and they had to become compliant to like SOC 2, type 2, or ISO 27001 or all of those security uh, framework and they, it was just above their head and they needed help. So my consulting team would come over, pretty much take, take over uh, their uh, security function. So there is that. So one one thing that I think that kind of differentiates us from uh, uh, the competition out there is uh, ensuring uh, that uh, we have implemented the best security practices for our uh, platform and all of the uh, apps. Uh, we uh, deploy, making sure we ensure the confidentiality, integrity, and avail availability for all of the customer data uh, we have, including uh, personal data as uh, well, right? So one one thing uh, we do directly, I haven't seen done a lot in Silicon Valley is uh, 
uh, we have a lot of uh, what we call PII filters. So they specifically look for any personal data with us, say credit card, name, email address, or anything like that. And when it's found, it, it flags uh, the, uh, the, um, the um, data, and then no one can uh, continue the conversation until we uh, uh, deal with it. And, 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 and once the issue has been resolved, then. Uh, the conversation continues. That, that is that is one thing. Uh, another thing we do different from everybody else is we once the, the question closes, we only uh, keep it for thirty days. After thirty days, we completely get rid of uh, all of that uh, data, which is pretty amazing. Uh, because you know, I've, I've worked for a lot of startups where they keep the data for forever, at least until uh, the duration of the uh, contract, which could be years and years and, and, and years. But directly, uh, we kind of lower that risk significantly by keeping it for. Uh, 30 days. Uh, do you, uh, and, do you, and there is, do you use the data though for training the model and then like normalize it and, and nominize it? Is that uh, how that works? Yes. Uh, the, the one we use for training the um, model doesn't have any uh, personal uh, okay. data and um, just the uh, uh, context. But again, we keep it for 30 days only, uh, which great. is um, pretty. Is, is that, pretty is that a secret cool. you just revealed about your back end system that a hacker's going to use? <laughs> No, no, I don't. I don't think uh, they uh, they uh, will. But 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 as, as, as I think uh, everybody is, who's out there doing security, they really need to think of way to uh, minimize uh, confidential data on the um, platform. Yeah. Uh, I think it's even better if you never receive confidential data at at all. But if if you do, try to uh, keep it for yeah. you know, as little time as possible. If you, if you just stay broke, you don't have any financial data to, data to give. <laughs> so here's my last question. Are we in a matrix? Yes or no? Maybe. I think it uh, uh, depends uh, how you uh, look at it. Well, you definitely are right now. Oh, God, what happened? Uh, I, we are in the matrix. It's not even a maybe at I this think point. Just generally speaking, I think in our life, uh, everything really uh, rises and falls on the decision we make, right? Uh, I, I think for many people, we they might consider themselves in the matrix in the ways that... Uh, uh, we have been uh, conditioned throughout life in you know, the way uh, you got raised in your society to almost act uh, automatically, right? As soon as something happens, you respond right away without thinking. It's completely unconscious. So, uh, and so many times also people are like, okay, where did time go? Like I just woke up this morning and it's already like 9, 9 p.m. or whatever. It's like they, they, they live their life, but they are pretty much sleeping. Uh, it's like zombies, right? So in, in, in that sense, yeah, I, I think you, you can say you are living in the matrix. But by becoming a better uh, leader, I can't remember who actually said it, but uh, you, you, you really have to find the space between the stimulus and the response, right? And then you have to make a decision. Uh, and one question I ask myself often is, okay, what is the wisest response that is aligned to the person I would like to become? Not who I am now, but who I want to be. What is the best response to this stimulus it's quite, it's quite and by, by asking that question i actually think and i don't just you know automatically uh res, 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 respond and i think about you know, my conviction my uh, core values and the, the person i want uh to be and then i come up with the wisest uh, response for the uh, scenario i think it, it makes me um better and it helps me manage uh my my time more like another question i ask myself is what is the best use of my time right now right so i think uh, as you become a better leader and you ask better question and you uh, you think better, you feel better and you respond better, I think uh, you find your way out of the matrix. That's a so really nice, you know, once again, I, I'm further lowering the IQ of this of this uh, conversation for sure. I love that response to take that moment. Now, I don't know if you learned that in the Navy because you definitely don't want to interrupt a senior officer <laughs> or cheering you out. So you're like, what is gonna be the best response to the person they need me to be in the next 12 seconds? So maybe there's a learned push-up related behavior <laughs> that I don't know, or running a little PT with that, um, whatever, whatever horrible things you'd have to do if you did said the wrong thing, um, for sure. Uh, but uh, I, I got to yes. tell you that, that that's a that's a great leadership trip trick that I'm going to just make my own and not give you any credit for. Just you know, a perfect leadership yeah, skills, just taking all the credit for it. But no, I, that's a great <laughs> advice. Is what's the answer? It's almost like a fatherly answer. What's the answer I want to give you as opposed to the one I actually currently execute and believe in? <laughs> so yes. who do you need to become? So, uh, Absolutely. I, like I think that's a great ending note. And um, uh, I really appreciate the time. And, and, you know, and we had a little time before and after these things that, that, to meet each other. And, and you're an incredibly interesting person. I hope to get to meet in person one day. 
uh, once this this uh, COVID thing becomes the next COVID thing, then we'll just worry about it then. But but I do I do mean I really hope to get to meet you in person one day, and I truly appreciate the time. Thank, thank you so much, Tom. Uh, I'm I'm really glad uh, I got to meet you virtually first in the Apple Technology uh, Council platform. Uh, I think what you're doing is very important. Thanks again I, for I, having me and uh, my see you on today. I appreciate it. I, 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 it means it means more to me than you can imagine. So thank you. Have a great day. I'll talk to you uh, hopefully soon. I hope you enjoyed the video today. Thank you for listening, watching. Please subscribe, turn on notifications, hit that like button, and drop me a comment below. AI Nerd. AI with attitude.